Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. Welcome to Tag Tuesday. I'm coming to you today with a new version of a tag that has quickly become beloved here on BookTube. It was initially created by the amazing host of Shake Temper, Kelly, Jason, and Nicole, who put together a series of questions about each of our journeys with Shakespeare. And then, realizing how wonderfully flexible those questions were, Roz and Tilly morphed it into the Victorian literature journey tag. Suddenly, it seemed clear that slight variations on these questions were going to be with us for a long time, for a whole lot of themed reading months ahead of us. Since no one has actually put together a nonfiction journey tag yet, at least that I've run across, I thought I'd give it a go. So onwards. The first question is, what was your first experience reading nonfiction? I've told this story before, maybe even in my first video here on BookTube, but my first nonfiction book, as far as I remember, was a fat biography of Helen Keller, Bound in Blue. I was in the first grade, and my class members and I were all gathered around a low table in the school library, a table covered with picture books for us to check out. When I complained that I had already read all those books, the librarian kindly gestured to the rest of the shelves and told me I could choose anything I wanted. I picked up the thickest volume I could find, and I loved it. So a biography is what pulled me in, but I must admit that Nancy Drew Mysteries kept me busy for the next little while, along with Encyclopedia Brown, my mother's old Bobsy Twins editions, and Louisa May Alcott's novels, instead of nonfiction. It was probably in fourth grade or so, when I had read all the novels in my small school library, that I turned to the biography shelf again, at my father's suggestion. And this time, I ran across a whole series of books about the childhoods of famous people. I read about the early years of multiple U.S. presidents, and then started reading about the childhoods of composers. I especially loved hearing about the naughtiness of Haydn, whose piano pieces I was learning right then. My memory is that he took his scissors and cut off the pert ponytail of the boy sitting in front of him in class, or maybe he dipped it in his inkwell, I'm not sure. But this reading started a deep devotion to biography, especially biographies of artists and musicians and authors, even after they became grown-ups. Question two, has the reading of a work of nonfiction ever brought you to tears? Well, six years ago, when I was still trying to recover from chemotherapy for breast cancer, I read a heartbreaking book by a poet living in North Carolina who was dying of breast cancer. Her writing was so beautiful, both poetic and intensely immediate, and, well, almost plain and quotidian in some ways. The book is The Bright Hour, a memoir of living and dying by Nina Riggs. By the time I read it, I knew there was a high likelihood that I would live for many more years. I could really focus on her family stories, not panic about my own situation quite so much. And shortly after I finished that beautiful book, my husband was diagnosed with a different disease, but one that we knew would kill him. Nina Riggs' beautiful book had a huge influence on how we lived after he received his diagnosis. I highly recommend Riggs' book. It's an honest, sad, and also life-affirming book. Question three. Are there any people who've played a significant role in your nonfiction journey? Absolutely. My mother, in many ways, paved my path into adult fiction, but my father is the one who gave me nonfiction. He was a history professor, and when I was in middle school, he was turning what had been his dissertation into a book. That was in the days before computers, and I remember him laying out all of his note cards on the shag rug in our living room and trying to figure out his footnotes and his index. He was writing an academic book for a university press, but his goal 
was to make his work accessible to non-academic readers. The way he was going to know that he had done that successfully? If I, as a preteen reader, could understand what he was writing. I'll talk just a bit more about him in a later question, I think. Question four, do you enjoy documentaries? Do you have a favorite? Is there a subject you'd like to see discussed on film? I do very much enjoy documentaries. I love to watch the quiet but miraculous nature films of David Attenborough. I also watch a lot of history documentaries. I joked in the written question that we need to prepare some ideas for Ken Burns. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, he's an American filmmaker whose first big documentary was on the Civil War. The series really broke new ground in showing how film documentarians could use even a limited number of still photographs to produce a moving story. And since then, Burns has made a number of other documentaries on a vast array of topics, from the Roosevelts to baseball. What I love to watch now is documentaries on authors. Let me know down in the comments if you have any special favorite literary documentaries. The fifth question has me a bit stumped, although I really like the question. Have you read a biography about or a memoir of a person with whom you identify? Well, after a visit to Concord, Massachusetts, when I was little, my parents bought me a children's biography of Louisa May Alcott, the author of Little Women. The book was Invincible Louisa by Cornelia Meeks. As the child of white Southern civil rights activist, I think I identified with Louisa primarily because she too grew up in a family committed to politics that weren't the same as many of the other people around her. And yet she had what seemed to be a pretty conventional childhood, just as I did. I remember loving that book when I first read it, but I've heard from other readers that it doesn't seem quite up to snuff for today's readers. Have any of you read it recently? The sixth question, read aloud a short passage you love from a work of nonfiction. I want to read a paragraph from an essay my father wrote about what he called the legacy of disunion. I am a Southerner and I love the South, but I reject the notion that the test of one's loyalty to the region is reverence for the Confederacy. Secession has precipitated the bloodiest war in American history to preserve the right of some Southerners to hold other Southerners in perpetual bondage. In retrospect, it's difficult to see how anyone who truly loves the South can ponder the disastrous Confederate experiment without more shame than pride. When the folly of our forefathers in breaking up the Union brings down pain and poverty upon three generations of Southerners, we do not serve the region well by praising them for it. Question seven. Do any works of nonfiction intimidate you? Which ones and why? Yes, indeed. For those of you who've watched this channel for a while, you know that I'm pretty intimidated by any book in any genre or any subject that is more than about 750 pages or so. That is certainly true of nonfiction, and is, in fact, why I have not bitten off Seven Pillars of Wisdom by T.E. Lawrence, that is, Lawrence of Arabia. But I'm also really intimidated sometimes by nonfiction about subjects I know little about. Sometimes I even hear how accessible a work of relatively popular nonfiction is, and still panic at the thought. Perhaps a classic example here for me is Godel Escher Bach, An Eternal Braid by Douglas Hofstetter. Art? Music? Excellent. Math? Yikes. In addition to being over that magic 750 pages, the book's description seems bizarrely off-putting to me. Let me quote. Douglas Hofstetter's book is concerned directly with the nature of maps or links between formal systems. 
However, according to Hofstetter, the formal system that underlies all mental activity transcends the system that supports it. If life can grow out of the formal chemical substrate of the cell, if consciousness can emerge out of a formal system of firing neurons, then so too will computers attain human intelligence. Gödel Escher Bach is a wonderful exploration of fascinating ideas at the heart of cognitive science, meaning reduction, recursion, and much more. I get this paragraph just enough to know that it sounds really relevant for today. Talk me into it down in the comments if you love this book. Question eight is, what tips would you give to hesitant readers of nonfiction? I have two thoughts on this. First, if you have a special interest in a particular topic, search out a book about that topic, be it the history of knitting, or a study of polar exploration, or whatever. If nothing especially pops out at you, though, try reading about the lives of individual people, in biographies, or in memoirs, which are often especially accessible, or even in collections of letters or diaries. If you're looking for specific suggestions of books about life stories, you might look here on YouTube for videos made during the reading event called People April. Or check out the two nonfiction suggestion videos made recently by Steve Donahue, which contain a lot of such works as well. Question nine. What are your favorite works of nonfiction? Well, one of the very earliest videos I made here on BookTube is a discussion on exactly that. The book is The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down by Anne Fadiman. In short, the book is a riveting story of how a Hmong refugee family and a team of American physicians clash and then struggle to find a way to communicate over the care of a young Hmong girl with severe epilepsy. The two groups, and some other people involved in the story too, understand her epilepsy in very different ways, and they have quite different opinions about how she should be treated. The book really explores, with great sensitivity, differences in cultural assumptions and spiritual beliefs, etc. After I fell in love with this book, I shared it with my then-boyfriend, David, soon-to-be husband, a first-year medical student. He shared it with his fellow students and his medical school professors, all of whom were blown away. Actually, as the years went by, Fadiman's work had a really profound impact on how medicine came to teach concepts of cultural understanding, especially how doctors and other healthcare providers can talk about proposed medical treatments with people who might have a different or even conflicting vision. Doctors don't need to accept the interpretations of others as true in the scientific sense in order to treat their patients with dignity. I'm going to leave a link to my old video, which really does talk about the book in ways I'm still fairly proud of, even though the video itself shows me looking even more awkward in front of the camera than I feel now. Well, the only thing left is to tag people. And I'm going to tag a lot of people, which I will do more fully down in the description box. But let me name at least a few here. I want to both tag and thank our wonderful host of Nonfiction November, Olive, at the channel at Book Olive, the host of Shakespeare September, Kelly, Jason, and Nicole, who created the first iteration of this perfect and amazingly flexible tag, the creators of the Victorian Literature Journey tag, Roz and Tilly, for recognizing the brilliance of what the Shakespeare folks had come up with, and Steve Donahue, who has put out a couple of amazing and amazingly long suggestion lists full of great nonfiction choices for us to enjoy. Well, that will do it for this video. Thanks for joining me here today on Hannah's Books. See you soon.